shortly. Well, joining us live now is Peter Matthews, Professor of Political Science at Cypress College. And the more and more, Peter, that we look at this, it's so obvious, isn't it, what's gone on? It really is. And that phone call that uh, became public between uh, Minority Leader McCarthy and the President, which uh, Congresswoman uh, said was that she, he had told her about it, that phone call is just a really amazingly uh, revealing because the state of mind of the President during the insurrection was revealed. He wasn't concerned about Mike, uh, Vice President Pence being taken away or the members of Congress being in danger because McCarthy was pleading for help. And the president said, you know, it looks like those people, meaning his people, or the ones who were in the, the insurrection people, were actually more concerned about the vote than was McCarthy. He put him down for that instead of saying, look, let me send the National Guard. Let me make sure you get reinforcements as yours so everyone is safe. President Trump was in dereliction of duty in that sense, some people would say. And what about the witnesses? Because uh, no further witnesses are being called at the hearing in the last hour or so in the uh, Senate impeachment hearing. Yeah, the witnesses are important. And in this case, the Congresswoman's uh, statement would be through a written document, I believe. But it'll still be valid because it's something that's uh, proof and evidence of the president's state of mind. So they want to make sure they call the correct witnesses and the right witnesses because if they have the wrong witnesses that might speak against the, the House managers and say something that's off the record, off the wall in the sense that it hurts the House managers' case, that would be detrimental. So that's one reason they're being careful who they call and not to call too many witnesses that could speak in the wrong uh, direction. So that's why this congressman's uh, testimony is the most important. And the fact that she said that this happened is really something that's believable and shows the president's state of mind and the intent that he had. If he didn't have the intent to have this type of uh, insurrection take place or stopping of the vote count, then he would have right away been alarmed when he heard about Vice President Pence being taken, you know, west off the floor is also heard about McCarthy begging for help, he would have said, I'm sending people over right away. That shows that he really wasn't concerned. And there are some allegations the people around him said that he was basically pretty quiet and then just, you know, looking at what was going on in television and didn't really care about it too much about well, rescuing the people there. Yeah, well, that statement, I think it was on social media somewhere right at the time, well, as it was happening, he was basically saying at the start of the dialogue, stop it, and then boom, <laughs> just turned the corner and said, but this election's been rigged, blah, 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 blah. So it, it was it was just, it was really petrol to the flames. It was, and you saw the results of it. You know, it wasn't until later on, around 6 o'clock, he says, he calls it off and tells people, he tells the people that conducted the insurrection that he loves them, they were good people. You know, that really shows you a state of mind and the direction that he was really so upset about losing the election. He could not accept it. He would go do anything that he could to retain power. And this is a very dangerous thing. As Congressman Ted Lieu said, that if President Trump is not convicted, the Senate votes to exonerate him and does not convict him, this might encourage him to do it again and to run again in 2024. If he loses again, to call the same thing, call all those millions of supporters to come to the White to the Capitol and do the same thing. Or it could encourage another person who's a candidate to do the same thing and bring in authoritarianism and a dictatorship uh, kind of rule to America. That's very dangerous. Yes, yeah, so I was also going to ask you about that. Uh, what kind of effect do you think this is having uh, on the Republican Party, this impeachment trial, and, and what kind of role are we looking at for Donald Trump uh, moving forward? Because uh, there's certainly being talk on him having his own party uh, separate to the Republicans. Yes, and that would be very significant. If he broke away his people from the Republican Party, that could be around 50% of the party at this point. 56% actually still support him, even after all of the revelation of the insurrection. 56% of the Republicans support him. So if he breaks that faction away, that means what's left is a rump faction, a smaller group, even though they're more you know, in line with the mainstream ideas, they're more in line with the rule of law, they're more moderate Republicans who believe in smaller government, but still are willing to honor the Constitution. These Republicans will have less power than the Trump Republicans, unless something changes in the minds of the people once they've seen this. We'll have to wait and see. But right now, the party looks like it could be split irreparably and that's a very danger for democracy. We need a strong second party. So it could have a two-party system, at least two parties, to debate and discuss issues. And that's really important to have a good Republican party that's strong and believes in the rule of law. What do you think is going to happen? And what do you think the outcome will be? It, it depends. You mean in terms of the vote on the impeachment? I, I mean, I I mean because different. a lot of people, particularly watching this this morning, see the word impeachment. It's the second time. It's unprecedented, like so many things throughout the past four years. But, but what do you think will happen in this trial to the former president? 
It's very difficult to say right now exactly the, how the vote's going to go, but I think in general it seems like as this the witnesses the new development. That's a new thing, so that might change a few more minds. We know for sure about five to six Republicans have been willing to cross over and vote with Democrats on moving this forward and consider even consider a possible impeachment conviction. We know about five to six, but we need there needs to be about 17. If all the people in the Senate show up to vote on the day of the impeachment, or maybe, maybe that may be today, if all 100 are there, it takes two-thirds of the 100, that's 67, which means 17 Republicans have to cross over and vote with the Democratic alignment to make sure this conviction goes through. That's a number that's a little bit hard to reach at this point, unless the witnesses and this latest revelation about the, le the phone call that was made, and also there was another thing. Uh, president, the Trump's lawyers denied that he knew, that the president knew that Mike Pence, the vice president, had been uh, in danger and was whisked away. And the truth is that he did know because Senator Tuberville came out and said he got a phone, he made a phone call to the president at the time. He was talking to the president. The president called him actually and spoke to him about taking care of the vote, about slowing the vote down. When Tuberville said, look, the vice president has been taken away from the Senate. It's so dangerous here. Please, let's do something. The president didn't even want to respond to that. So, we don't know if that kind of activity, which has been exposed now publicly and to the other senators, might actually bring over the other 11 more senators who are needed from this, the five that we already probably have, five or six, in order to have the 17 come over and vote for conviction. We don't know yet. We'll know today, though. And our interview is probably before the vote takes place, so we'll see what happens, Timmy and Janie, too. We're going to switch topics. The White House released a statement recently of uh, Joe Biden on uh, safely reopening schools. We've got a bit of a graphic to show you, uh, our viewers here, which states that we can do more. It talks about scientific guidelines to make schools uh, safer and that today an entire generation of young people are on the brink of being set back up to a year or more of their learning. It talks about the rise in mental health due to uh, uh, isolation. I mean, this is a huge topic. It really is, and it's also very controversial because there are two sides to it. And certainly it is not a helpful thing to have to have so many of our children studying at home all year. And now it's been almost a year, hasn't it? And that must have had some kind of an effect. I mean, it depends on the child, too. If the children come from a fairly well-off affluent family, or one of the parents stays home to help to supervise the child while she's remote learning, that has helped the child. That child won't be back a whole year. It may not even be back at all, actually, because if they were doing remote learning with supervision for one of the parents, then that could be fine. But the other is the, the other problem is the lower income, moderate income people who, who had to go to work, both parents, um, and the children are neglected sometimes de facto because they, there's no one to supervise them while they're studying online. So that's a problem. It's been a major problem. So the point I would say, though, there is a very important question, and is, is it going to be fully safe to open up the schools? Will it be safe for the children? Will it be safe for the teachers? And most importantly, for the children, but also the families when the children go home at night? That has to be taken care of. That's why the need to develop the vaccines, especially a children's vaccine, and I think Pre President Trump said a child's vaccine should be available by the end of the summer, which means by the fall they should be able to go back. I think suggesting, what I would suggest is to keep them in remote learning, but provide the support service that they need, as many as can, and not rush them back to school until it's safe for all of them, because this could end up in another wave of, of infections as happened in other countries before. So it is a dilemma, you're right. Yeah, there, there has been some positive signs this week, though, of course. Uh, and, look, in a few weeks' time, we'll start to see some of those colder climates, uh, the, the, the temperatures start to moderate. Numbers... Well, that's in the, true. Yeah, in the, num the numbers have now been sort of dropping under 100,000. You mentioned before, or last week, you mentioned how you've had your first jab. So things are starting to slowly give an air of a trinkle of positivity. I don't want to go over the top on it, but there's a bit of it. Yes, that's true. Let's keep in mind the numbers still. You know, it's uh, about 100,000 a day that are getting infected. Almost 500,000 have actually died, and we've had a total of 28 million infections. So there's still this movement, yet there's movement also in the other direction. Well, like I said, I had my first jab last couple of weeks ago. I'm about to have it again. In two weeks, I'll be completely finished with my vaccination. I'm hoping the children's vaccine comes out in a couple of months, and certainly, you know, the rest of the population, and that'll help a lot. So the thing, there is a light that we're seeing at the end of the tunnel. That's the beauty of it. And I really must thank uh, the various leaders who have taken action this time around to coordinate this and to really push the preventive care that's so important. All right, Prof Professor Peter Matthews, thank you very much. And uh, we'll touch base with you again very shortly. Well, joining us live now,